All right, so I'm going to talk about my literal favorite boilerplate sections. And it sounds goofy. I'm sharing with you my boilerplate favorite terms so that you have a starting place if you ever start looking at or thinking about other contracts. But my secret sauce is when I'm doing an agreement from scratch, I can do the preamble, the you agree, I agree, we agree, you know, just describing what's going on with the agreement. No problem at all. The nuts and bolts of actually the agreement and what we agree on, it's always unique based on talking to the clients and figuring out kind of the best practices to make sure everybody's protected. But then when it comes to the boilerplate, these terms that are in every single agreement that there is, I copy and paste exactly what I'm sharing right into the agreement. There may be some little tweaks and I'm going to talk about how they can be different, but let's dive in. And to start with, we're going to talk about interpretation. What interpretation means is oftentimes with the agreements, there are, we call them capitalized terms where maybe you're just reading along and then it says, well, why is the purchase price capitalized versus just written like everyday language? You're used to reading purchase price. It's not like a title of a book. Well, it's because within a contract, these capitalized terms generally have a definition somewhere else within the agreement. So the purchase price may mean $1 million and it's defined as $1 million. And then every time the capitalized purchase price shows up, it's actually in reference to $1 million, not some unknown, whatever the purchase price may be. So that's where capitalized terms and the interpretation really get to be important. Also, and this is coming from an attorney side, it will often say just because one party drafted the agreement does not mean that the terms and the wording should be interpreted by a court against the drafting party. Something that's really important for you to watch out for, but really just to know what it means and understand that at the end of the day, in the court system, they are supposed to, unless this is included, interpret an agreement kind of in favor of whoever didn't write the agreement because they're just there to accept the terms. Now with this interpretation section added, it says it doesn't matter if I drafted it, you drafted it, my attorney did. The court, please just interpret based on the plain meaning or the capitalized terms of the agreement. Something else to dive in a little bit, counterparts. Oftentimes, well, traditionally, a contract, you have your signature area and everybody signs the same document. That's not very reasonable to expect in today's world. I'm sending stuff out by DocuSign. I'm faxing signatures. I have a company agreement that 30 people are supposed to sign. It's just unreasonable to expect everybody to sign the same document. So that's where we'll regularly have this counterparts uh, section within the boilerplate, just saying it doesn't matter if we sign the same agreement, you signed a different page, I signed a different page. The intention is to add everything together and it will create a single agreement. Now, severability. And I really want you to pay attention to what my favorite terms are. And I'll explain it. Generally, what severability means is even if some part of the agreement is unenforceable, the rest of the agreement will still be enforced. In very classic American common law, if there was one section that was not legal to enforce, the entire contract gets thrown out. And that's still literally the law today. If you don't include within your agreement this severability, which, like I'm saying, it says, okay, it doesn't matter if 
this one provision doesn't is not enforceable still pay attention to and still enforce the rest of the agreement but here's where my favorite terms kind of come into play i like to add if a term if a paragraph is determined deemed to be or it's just not going to be enforced by a court that in its place will be a similar provision that may be enforceable it creates a little bit of a risk because you know i hear it all the time why would i agree to this if i don't know what this is that may be enforced by a court system and my response is always the same well if some part becomes illegal some part of the contract becomes unenforceable between you and I, like every part of this is so very important that even if something gets cut out, I want new language to come in that's as close to your and my actual agreement than just saying, forget about this section and ignore it and enforce the rest of it. I will say that most of these sections does not include this in lieu of language. Most of them just says, you cut out that section, you enforce the rest of it, and keep on going down the path. So I wanted to explain to you why what I'm sharing with you gets to be a little bit different than the norm, but I think very important to consider. Next, the governing law and the jurisdiction. The governing law, what state laws are we really going to pay attention to? And maybe we're in Texas and you're in, in California. And there gets to be an argument if we don't have a dis decision on what law we're going to use. If you're in California, I breach the agreement. I break the agreement. Then all of a sudden, you run to your court. And you know what? Your court in California is going to initially implement California law. It just makes sense they're in California. What if I don't want California law to be enforced? Then the next solution is I run to court in Texas as quickly as possible to file the lawsuit first so that Texas law applies. Just it's it's not a, a healthy situation of let's see who can go to court the fastest. Now that's where these governing law terms says you and I, we're going to agree right now that Texas law applies. And you know what? If there's not a, a jurisdiction requirement, you have full rights to go to your California court. But if the contract says we're going to use Texas law, it doesn't matter if it's a California courtroom, they're still going to enforce Texas law. But generally, this what laws are we going to use also gets tied into what jurisdiction. Jurisdiction basically means place. What place will we have this court action in? For simplicity's sake, the governing law is wherever you live. The jurisdiction is, again, wherever you live. Why would you want to have that? Of course, if you and I were in agreement and you're in California, do I want to agree that we're going to use California laws? Do I want to agree that we're only going to go to California court? I don't want to. I'm in Texas. I want to include governing law. The required law is Texas law and the jurisdiction is in my backyard. If there's a problem, I want to go to my nearest courthouse. So by including these requirements within your classic boilerplate, it just simply puts the law on your side, meaning it's your home court advantage in your courtrooms and not having to cross the country in order to fight your case.